and, and the belletrists and uh, 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 scientists, everyone was imbued with the, with the Quran to a, a, a degree. So we have this interpretation. We, we must take seriously the, the somewhat subjective and historically conditioned, culturally conditioned um, parameters of the act of interpretation. That these were men of their time. That they had they thought in categories that are no longer familiar to us. That they had life experiences that were utterly different from ours. That they had uh, agendas that were much different than, than we have today. We, we, we have some insight into what they were doing, but we can't really know who they were, and therefore we are handicapped when it comes to actually reading what they wrote. Because we read them with 21st century eyes, thinking we know something about their time and place, but we don't know enough about who the individual author was. To, to continue with the notion that a tafsir does not carry an authorial presence, of course, is foolhardy. It is, it is a work of literature. It is a creative act. It is, it is not simply a, com, a, a computer program that churns out the meaning of the Quran. I warmly recommend to everyone who's interested in the problem this magnificent novel by Vladimir Nabokov called Pale Fire, which, uh, which, uh, which plays with the notion of commentator and author in a magnificently suggestive way for all people who are interested in the relationship. But the Quran is still being addressed to humanity, and it is still there waiting to be addressed in the 21st century for all of its wonderful insight and wisdom and uh, 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 expectations for humanity. How to, how to return to that issue? And m my feeling is strongly this, that we need to, in order to study the Quran, Yes, we can, of course, use the tafsir. For example, the, the idea of sakhr is very, very, very suggestive and makes things come alive. But what we need to do in the case of the Quran is to say to our students and our audience and people we try and talk to about the Quran that it is, it is a powerful work, that it, 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 it affects the mind, it affects the way you see the world, and we need to come to terms with how to put this across. And it seems to me that the, the best way to do this is through seeing the Quran as a work of art. Of course, we can't say that it's poetry because the prophet was not a poet, he was a prophet. And this has serious social implications for the time in which he lived. But it is, it is a work of art. And as a work of art, it deserves to be treated with all the tools that we have today uh, from literary criticism and uh, literary studies which tell us and show us how to read, how to make the words come alive, even, uh, even if there are these remaining obstacles uh, in our reading. So this is uh, what I wanted to share with you today. Thank you for your patience and attention. You seem to indicate that the metaphorical interpretation of, of the verse um, is the way most people have interpreted it. But I have read th that uh, in Al-Asar, from the very beginning, for the last thousand years, there have always been at least 15% of the professors who said that uh, Jesus salam, was crucified, but he did not die, yes. which is very critical for Christianity. Mm. Uh, and uh, this has survived in Sunni Islam too. Indeed, yeah, that is, that is another aspect of it. And uh, you know, the, I don't, first of all, I don't have a 600 page book on Central Asia. But you, I must, you must be confusing me something. No, I don't have one. I haven't written it. In any case, yes, this is, this, and of course the, uh, the Ahmadiyya take this to its uh, most uh, logical 
uh, conclusion by saying that Jesus survived the, the ordeal and then went off to Kashmir where his tomb may be visited today. That's right. This is one stream in, uh, in the interpretation, that he was crucified, and, and yeah, thank you for mentioning it. It does exist. But I didn't mean also to say that the, the majority of opinion about this verse uh, is that we should read it metaphorically. Quite the opposite. The majority of opinion seems to me to be that we read it as if it is not a metaphor for anything that someone else was on the cross and someone else endured that while Jesus was raised miraculously to heaven, bodily. Yeah. This, uh, this seems to be the majority opinion yeah, today. But I'm, I want to say that in the time when majority opinion was becoming crystallized, the time after which, we, in fact, coincidentally, we start f speaking about Sunni Islam and Shi'i Islam, it was still being debated within the Muslim, in the heartland of, of the Muslim community. And with, with, with learning, as Abu Hatim demonstrates. May I? Yeah, of course. Um, I'm, I'm just wondering, uh, did you have a look at uh, um, Al-Imran, uh, verse 55, where, where God says to, yes. to Jesus, yes, uh, yes, course, yeah. That's right, yeah. I mean, I, I'm sorry, I, 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 there are many verses in the Quran which refer to, there's a recent article, for example, in the SOAS Bulletin uh, by uh, Reynolds, which, which points out that the again, because it was pointed out by Jeffrey Perinder many years ago, that there are many verses in the Quran which refer to the death of Jesus. Right. And, uh, and in the context of these precedents, clearly the Muslim authors who later, remember friends, it is later that people become designated as Sunni, Shi'i, and Ismaili. It's not, it's not then surplus while the conversation is going on. People knew what each other's proclivities and inclinations were, but things become calcified after the fact. So it's, uh, you know, there's, a, there's a sense that there is a space in the Quran for the death of Jesus. There's no question about it. The, the verb is used, uh, and, uh, and then the idea of, of uh, the eternality of, of prophethood. In Kirmani, uh, the prophets are representatives of the universal intellect, which can never die. It is unthinkable that this can die. So in, the, in their bodily form, they are, in, they are dramatizations of this cosmic metaphysical principle, the universal intellect, which is uh, imperishable, even though the person who's representing it clearly is born, lives, and dies. It's, uh, it's uh, an orientation. It's a way of reading the Quran. And of course, I'm not saying that the original uh, verse takes all this into account. But it is also clear that uh, in the history of Christianity, there is debate about the status of the crucifixion and what happened to Jesus afterwards. In some of the apocryphal gospels, for example, you find in the gospel, the apocryphal gospel of John, you find the crucifixion taking place over here, and Jesus is up here consoling his mother and Mary, Magdalene, saying, do not worry. They only think, it's almost Quranic, it's almost exact Quranic mm -hmm. phrase. Sure, they only yeah, think that. That, they're, that, that, they're, that they're crucifying me. But I, and he's laughing, he's smiling, but I assure you, you know, I am safe. Do not cry, do not worry. Uh, so this is, there's a precedent for this understanding, this if you like, docetic understanding of the Quranic verse, where the, it is the spirit that is eternal and real and the body that is ephemeral. Now, people counter this, oh, this couldn't possibly have come from the seventh century Hijaz. This is much too sophisticated. Now, let's not forget, we're talking to, we're, we're talking to virtuoso poets, people whose lives depend on word art and the, the way to express the inexpressible, the way to bring the unseen into reality. As it says in the Old Testament, uh, an effective word or a goodly word is like silver apples and golden baskets. It's there. You, cannot, you can see it. It makes it live. So th these, these poetic turns in the Quran deserve much more attention as poetry 
than, than as doctrine, frankly. And I think uh, and it's, this is the way that we will be able to uh, speak more appropriately and more helpfully about the Quran to, some, if you like, a somewhat skeptical audience or one who finds it too problematic to try and penetrate this unusual book which has no beginning, no middle, no end, but seems to be everywhere at the same time. And it's quite, quite beyond and apart from our normal experience of, of, of reading and books and so on. We need, we need uh, all of the uh, help that we can get. Because the Quran deserves, and has not yet achieved it in, in Western academia, it, it deserves to be in the library of the great books as a monument of world literature. And it's taking a long time to get there. Dr. Lawson, I'd like to first of all commend you. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, on this uh, very excellent uh, uh, debate that you brought up. I mean, this has uh, clarified so many things in my mind. Let me talk as a relative Philistine in this area mm -hmm. and, uh, and uh, hear me through. Um, your uh, distinction between the body and the soul, mm -hmm. which comes out of the interpre interpretation of that particular verse in the Quran, as well as what has been said in many of the Gospels. You mentioned John, St. John, Matthew, was it also Luke, Luke yeah. yeah and so forth. Abu uh, Hatim mentioned those. Yes, yeah. well, so in the end, I mean, you put all this together, um, the controversy seems to be laid to rest. So my question <laughs> becomes, um, why is this such an important issue? Is this because, is, or is this stemming from people who had already decided that they would like to differentiate, rather than using that verse to differentiate? Well, I, I think that's an extremely interesting question, and for a long time I thought that this was, you know, Islam, Islam's notion of salvation is quite sui generis. They're not like Christian notions of salvation. Uh, Jesus' crucifixion is important in Christianity because of the soteriology, chiefly, one might say. And if it helped also to differentiate the Muslims and give a distinct identity, well, so many other things in the history of religion seem to function this way as well, to, to you know, isolate a, a, a community and an ethos and a, and a message. So this indeed might have, have much to, uh, also might play a part in it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, please. Um, delineating, you know, politically, the Dome of the Rock, yes. internal mosaics, all yeah, about Jesus. Beautiful, yes, yeah. yes, uh, the, the oldest Islamic building that we have, yes. Right. So. Can I, first of all, thank you, that was lovely. Oh, um, thank you. I, I, two, two quick things. One is, um, what uh, or if uh, would there be a particular salience for this interpretation for Ismailis in particular? Uh, or was it just that it happened to be something that appeared in Ismaili texts? And, and, and just very quickly, and you can probably just dismiss this in two seconds, crucifixion in, in, in the Islamic context in the early period often happened after death rather than as a means of, of death. And of course, in the Quranic verse, it's kataluhu and then sadabuhu. So uh, is that, uh, does that play into the interpretation at all? Uh, that's a, I've, I've thought about this. I don't have anything, to, any light to shed on. The other thing to know about crucifixion is that it was a terrible, terrible fate. It was, it was uh, Zeidensticker has just published an article on the social function of crucifixion in the medieval period, and that was just the worst possible fate for anyone. So this, this might also have insulted, you know, pious Islamic sensibilities, that the idea that such a thing could happen to one of uh, the noblest beings that ever drew a breath. I mean, this, this is quite possible as well. Um, what is, the, why the Ismailis? Yeah, and why are they willing to, that's, that's, I don't have a real answer for it, except to say that in the Isma, Ismaili literature, there is a tendency to, of course, not rely on Isnad and Matan, but to rely upon a kind of engagement with the text as such, and to, 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 to think uh, 
literarily, if you like, about it. So, so this is, but it's a, it's a very important question. I wish I had more to say. We, we find, uh, we find Jafar Mansur Yemen also has, upholds the notion of the cross. Sijistani even has a diagram in his uh, Yanabe in which the cross is, <laughs> is drawn out and, and, and coordinated with the elements of the Shahada to show that it's an, they're exa they are isometric, if you like. That, that the cross, the Shahada, yes, it's, a, it's a way of, of, of evoking the, the divine somehow. So it's a, why they were not so allergic to it and others were, which came first, the Ismaili interpretation and, and the later one was a reaction to this, it's a, it's a great question. Sorry, I can't <laughs> help you too much more than that. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much for your talk. I did have one quick question. Um, you mentioned that. Can you get a little bit closer? Sorry. You mentioned that um, if we look at the Mufassirun, uh, we have to sort of understand them in a historical context. I think. Yeah. But it seems to me early in the morning someone um, raised a concern that if everything that mentions the Quran should be seen as tafsir, as interpretation, then that make, sort of nullifies. You know, that just broadens the scope so much that we'll have nothing. Right. And in the same way, I feel like if we limit each person's understanding just to their time and speaking something of their time, I think we take so much away that in the same way it becomes nihilistic. It becomes... Nihilistic. I mean, we, we oh. are left with nothing. And so I feel like one way to understand, we don't really have to understand time in, with reference to God as a linear line. I mean, we could think of it as a circle and each generation being equidistant from God True. and not necessarily moving away and so their interpretation not being important. Equal if not more, yes. Uh, but the Mufasarun are not God. This is the point. Mm -hmm. The Mufasarun are men who walk around in the marketplace and try to make a living and have people help them put the tafsirs together and collect hadith and, uh, you know, have indigestion and are grumpy and are, you know, husbands and uncles and uh, they live in the world. They're not, they're not prophets necessarily. I mean, not at all. You know, they are mufassirun. They try to explain. So I think it's, I mean, uh, you know, to, to uh, go along with the rules of reading as we now have come to understand them in this point in history and, you know, people have been studying this pretty intensely as you know, we need to, we need to take seriously, not completely, but we need to take seriously uh, the author and the author's situation. It's not a perfect key to what they're saying, that we also know, but we need to understand who they were. Like the book of Giglio, for example, on Tabari. It's magnificent, you know, it talks about the time, the place, and, uh, and his, his achievement. So we need to understand what are the pressures and wh what, are the, what are the major concerns of a given author, as much as we can. I agree, but I just feel like we should also give them credit that they are trying to understand God's word, and they, they do understand that they must contextualize themselves. I think we don't give them enough credit in that sense. Hmm. Um, that they do understand what is going on with them, that there is history, there is time, some things are happening to them, some things are influencing them, just like we can understand ourselves. What are the influences on us? Right. Why we think, you know, modernity is this upward moving curve, whatever else. Right. So I just feel like sometimes when you talk about these Mufassirun, we are not giving them enough credit. Oh, well, I certainly didn't mean to give that, if I might have, just, if we have yeah, a second, sure. yeah. Uh, I don't mean to give that impression at all. One has the greatest admiration for these people. I mean, if you read the, 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 if you read what we know about Ibn Jarir, for example, it's touching. You know, he was so pious. He was so he was so focused on his work. He was he was he was working fisa He was he was doing, and this is a, an element that is missing in our understanding of, of the tafsir. It's a mode of expressing one's piety. It's a mode of communion with the, with the divine spirit. It's, getting, it's being with the text. It's like communion, in a sense, in an Islamic at key, right? It is, it is dealing with, with the word at a very molecular level. So it is an act of piety, and of course, but we still recognize that they are historical beings, right? That's all. Yeah. Thank you for your question. 
and I'm happy I had a chance to clear up any misunderstanding. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Um, with, yes, please. Thank you, Dr. Hammer, uh, and thank you to the organizers for Maria, particularly for having invited me here, and thank you to all of you for coming to to join us in this very interesting uh, couple of days. Perhaps I should begin by answering the question. Uh, I, I direct, uh, because it bears on what I'm about to say, uh, my project is about Christian theologies that are responsive to Islam, which is to say, Christian theologies that are not reactive against Islam, Christian theologies which are not afraid of Islam, but Christian theologies which take uh, the Islamic critique seriously, uh, Christian theologies that recognize Islamic theological discourse as part of the same discourse uh, and which need to be engaged, so, uh, and that in a positive way. So, I hope that. Three decades ago, uh, when a number of revisionist approaches to the Quran and early Islamic history were proposed within the space of a few years, the questions at issue and the mutually incompatible answers proposed seemed of interest almost exclusively to scholars. Yet in our own day, it seems that any new theory about the Quran, at least those proposed by non-Muslims, is likely to become fodder even for popular news shows and talkback radio. Although it is perhaps this polemical pseudo-scholarship that dominates the public discourse, I, I want in this paper to confine myself to, to sketching just a couple of what I see as basically opposing trajectories emerging among non-Muslim scholars of the Quran. The publication, and this is the first trajectory I, I would identify with uh, this gentleman I'm about to speak about, the publication of Christoph Luxemburg's Di Siro Aramaesha Leza des Koran, the Germans will excuse my pronunciation, mm -hmm. uh, the Syro Aramaic way of reading the Koran, uh, excited a great deal of popular and journalistic attention without, for the most part, finding a serious hearing among scholars who remained and who still remain generally unconvinced by Luxemburg.